thank you, uh, Ranga Mitra, for joining us uh, today. This is very uh, impromptu, but we thought we would uh, seek your wisdom and your counsel and your life's experience on this show called What Now? Uh, what shall we do in this moment of uh, existential angst, awakening, <coughs> possibilities? And uh, I don't know, you've never met you, so I I'm going to turn it over to Anika and John who do know you. And um, I look forward to our, our conversation today. Thank you, Could thank I you very much, Mark. And thank welcome you, here, Rangam. Uh, could I just ask John to please introduce him for us? And how do you two know each other? I'm delighted. Um, Rangam and I met, I think, probably in 1979. Rangam, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Ah. Um, I think at that time he was stationed in um, Hong Kong and I was based in London. And we came together at a conference, I believe. and. Um, we had a conversation at a fairly esoteric level. We started off with an esoteric conversation. I thought, well, this is unusual. <laughs> <laughs> and so it turned out to be. And so we've been friends since 79. That's a long time. How many years is that? Oh, that's a, well, that's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I've seen Rungham, Rungham's passion uh, it for for life and for living, for people and for study and for learning and for acquiring skills and knowledge, but most of all for understanding why we're here and who we are and what we can become. So he's a natural philosopher and um, a natural student, I think, actually, although he, he won't confess to that. Um, and he's played a very important management part, senior management role uh, at the bank where we work together. And um, uh, it was a great coming together. So it's so a great pleasure to see you face to face, Rangam. I know we're going to learn a lot from you and uh, speak to us with your heart. And uh, I know that it will have great meaning. So this is a good opportunity because in our previous talk, we were talking about philosophy and practicality and, you know, love of wisdom and that wisdom that come from a deeper space. So it's good to hear Mr. Rangam here and talking about nothingness as well. <laughs> Welcome to our show. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Anika. And of course, thank you, John. He's always more kind and says wonderful things about me, much, much, much beyond what I am. But anyway, be that as it may. He's that, he's that type, of type of a person. He's a wonderful man. And as, as, as I said in my little note to you, I think I've learned more from him. I've learned, I owe, owe him a lot of what, I'm, what I am today. I am just, I'm, what we are today is just a human being. But let me tell you on this point of nothingness, Anika. Um, I had, as I mentioned, I had the privilege of being an executive assistant to Mr. Abibi, and whom I think you all know you know who he is. And one of my main functions as his executive assistant was to translate into management practice his thinking and his, and his expressions. Very difficult. Um, I don't know if Anika's there and she can hear me. She too. is. She's just She's adjusting the lighting. Okay. Uh, <laughs> wonderful. It makes it more interesting. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway so one day Mr. Abhidhi came up as he walked past my desk. He said, I've discovered the meaning of cosmic existence. And I said, oh, I, and what I'd normally do was pick up my pad and pen and, or pencil or whatever it was and go to his desk and wait for him to say something. And he, this is what he said. These words are stuck there and they can never, never, I can never lose them. But this is what he said. Out of nothingness came totality into which quality was poured to create the parts which interact with themselves to return to totality and nothingness. So that to me, Mr. Mitra, is the cosmic existence. And he walked off. Now I wrote this down as he was talking, managed to write it down fast. And for 
believe it or not, for months afterwards, I'd look at this piece of paper and I'd say, we're running a $25 billion bank and I'm stuck <laughs> with this, whatever it is. How do I resolve this? What is this, you know? And he said, everything is contained in that. And then one day, maybe three months later, oh, I can't remember, I had the Eureka moment. Mm. It just hit me like that, what he meant. And believe you me, everything that he said fell into any action I did, any action you did, any action we did, the bank did, or anybody did. It all fell into place. And that was a great revelation, a moment of revelation to me. But that, uh, Anika, was nothing else. Because initially I said, what is nothingness? And if totality came out of nothingness, how could totality be in nothingness? And then how could quality be poured in totality? Because then quality is outside totality and not within. These were the questions I asked, logical questions. Sorry, but can I to... now ask a practical question whilst we Please. are at it? So you're working in a bank, right? And you're into management. How do, in, in a practical sense, why would you need to talk about totality and quality in this respect? Can you maybe give us a practical example, especially for our viewers, so they Absolutely. can understand? Absolutely. Um, let me give an example. We had gone to Japan um, at the opening of our branch there. And it was a big affair. And when we actually got into the branch, uh, Mr. Abidi, the manager there, took us around, showed us the bank on the ground floor, and moved up to his office in the first floor. And then we all sat around in a meeting. And uh, Mr. Abidi asked the manager, how big is your branch? To which the manager sort of looked at me and said, uh, you know, kind of said, but we just went around the bank. You know, we did show him. So he said, well, you know, we, this is the ground floor, the first floor. So he said, no, I really want to know how big do you see your branch? He said, oh, I'm negotiating with the neighbors to take over one of the, the offices. And uh, I too was amazed and, bit, you know, wasn't quite sure what Mr. Abadi was saying. And then he said, Mr. So-and-so, where is your business coming from? You will not have one penny of business from Japan. Your business is outside of Japan. The people who live outside wanting to business in Japan who will be giving you business. You have, you will, your business is in New York, in London. It's all over in Europe, in Paris. That's where your branch, so the walls of your branch are not physically here in Tokyo. The walls of your branch are universal, are global, you know? And to mm -hmm. me, that opened up a fantastic idea that everywhere that we had branches, we were seeking business from within that uh, geographical territory. Whereas in fact, our business, we could have captured much more business if we looked outside. Given that, we set up a division called EMP or external marketplace, where every branch tried to find their business opportunities outside. And in this, in the, we, without going into details, we did one form of business from the Far East. And the overall turnover that we had for this over the years was a stagnant two, uh, $2 billion turnover. In a year and a half setting up this division, we moved it from two billion to seven and a half billion. And nobody even understood it. And nobody realized that we were able to do that. So that was converting his thing into banking practice. And it was done with complete understanding, complete love, complete humility, and encompassing all the people from all over around the world, from different cultures, with just this one act of, of the pillars of management, of love, humility, giving, and submission to the, the bigger thing. That's, that's it. So I have a, I have a question. This is, uh, Anik and I have spent many hours. I only know John for two weeks, so I can't claim to, can only call him a, virtual friend. 
Uh, the question on, it's fascinating what, what uh, Mr. Abadie said. Uh, we use Latin words for money creation, ex nihilo or fiat, which means to be created out of nothing, out of thin air. Oh. I've studied banking my whole life, money creation. It's fascinating we use those Latin words. Out of nothing, we create currency, we create liquidity. Uh, what an amazing magical trick. And here we are at this important juncture in the economic existential crisis, in which it's now being revealed, I believe, that the creation of money is so simple, the mind is repelled, as John Kenneth Galbraith said. Oh. From your experience within the system, in which you must have seen the magic, the, the amazing ability through ledger bookkeeping entries to create money, ex all, and then every amount of abundant quantity that from 2 billion to 7 billion to 100 billion, there's no limit to the possibilities um, without, and maybe this would be an amazing moment. I don't expect you to reveal all the secrets of, you know, the kernel secret recipe, but I know what those secret spices are <laughs> when it comes to money creation. <laughs> Uh, okay, we must convince you to release those secret uh, knowledge. Um, <laughs> in this case, Mark, now I'll come to what you're saying, uh, the point, but in this case of increasing from 2.5 to, I mean, just 2 to 7.5 million, was a turnover act of activity. That's all it was. It wasn't the actual physical creation of money. We just managed to put more business through a system than we were doing all this while. It wasn't so, the creation of money. So you weren't creating, you weren't issuing loans yet. You were just no, building oh a God, system of no, relationship. No, I'm, I, I'm, um, I'm meant to be, a, uh, my forte has been a trade finance. So we're looking at trade finance, which is mm. quite different, we believe, because I believe that's the answer to banking, not, not what. And much of it was also embedded within Islamic banking. You know, we weren't talking about debt. We were talking about mm. asset. Mm. Right, right. Assets. Thank this, you. Th th that's the purity of thing where where the lender took took a share or, or took carry the risk as much as the person who was conducting the business okay so this this itself is brilliant because I, i've said everything banking should ultimately be based on assets we lend against assets but in a shared equity model we're in relationship okay. with each other Absolutely. Absolutely. this we're is sharing. the basis of islamic finance yeah. yeah so i know i'm throwing it down quickly but i I find this fascinating because this is part of our conversation. What shall we do next? Because we're oh. seeing that, that the system that we, we were educated in, in fact, we were ignorant of how it actually works. And, and you both are veterans of the system. Anik and I are just pretenders. You know, we want to be in, at the table that you've set for us. Um, but, but I know that party's over. Uh, Mr. Abadi is done, all gone, left us. And, and yet we have your knowledge and experience to chart a new course. Mark, your humility knows no bounds by the sound of it. <laughs> you know, in this case, I think we're all pretenders if we, uh, yeah, uh, maybe, bigger, maybe bigger than you actually are. But, but uh, be that as it may, I think each one of us have, have a world of knowledge and, um, and live, have lived in our knowledge, world of knowledge. And as I was telling John the other day, how much is it, how big is it, how small is it, is totally unknown because the, mm. the wholeness is, it's infinite. It's that nothingness that we were talking about, you know? It's all in there. So it, mine just might know a fraction if I really got to know the size of it. And if, if I'm, if I'm uh, proud and uh, I think too much of myself, then I think I know a lot, right? So mm. it depends on depends on the character of the person. Um, going back to the point of creating money. Yes, I think I, I uh, John, I don't know if I sent you that um, video of money is debt. Mm -hmm. I think you got that. Yes, yeah. Money is debt. I sent it's it worth, to it. It's worth repeating over and over again mm. uh, because people don't understand what that means. Money that, is debt. Yeah. That animation that I sent yes. uh, is just incredible because that says it all that now bankers have the ability by just signing to create any amount of money they want. Hmm. Wasn't it Rockefeller that said uh, in that 
uh, in one of the comments extracted from that uh, video that I don't care who makes the laws as long as I have the ability to make money, <laughs> I'm happy. They control, they control everything. Mm -hmm. And they will continue. And creating debt means each one of us want to gain more materially. Mm. And the concept of materialism, as John and myself were discussing, comes out not because of debt. But if you go back in time, it really comes out because of the times of Newton and Descartes and all that. When they physical, looked at the physics of things, I'm not a physician, so I, I mean a physical physics man. But what they discounted in their calculation was anything that could not be measured or was anything that was intangible and unseen was not mm. taken into account. And only that which was tangible and material and that I could measure mm -hmm. and, and I could feel and touch was actually what physics was based on. Mm -hmm. And this is what led to our, mater our, our desire for materialism. Everything was structured around getting something that I could see and measure. And it was only through quantum physics or the learning of physics that we found that it's the intangibles within the humanity, within human beings, and the feelings and the senses that we have, that actually start affecting the material thing, as a split, the two zone, you know, two split uh, experiment, which I'm sure you're aware of, has shown us that the mere yes. act of mere act of observation can change a particle from performing being what the particle is. It's Dr. Bruce so, Lipton's work. Absolutely. Biology of belief. Yeah. Sorry, say that again. Dr. Bruce Lipton's work, uh, epigeneticist, the biology, the biology of belief. Is that uh, is that brilliant? I mean, brilliant. And uh, thank you for for Descartes. You know, imagine if he had said, "I I feel, therefore I am." Uh, Ranga, I'm, I'm going to keep asking questions because you got me going. Is uh -huh. when you were with Mr. Abadi, um, you know, one of the four the principles Tom Thys and, and John you know about. Well, all three of you know about is this principle that, you know, basically every, you know, it, it was um, Luca Pazzioli and Leonardo da Vinci who designed the double entry bookkeeping system, the, the accounting system we still use today in, in, uh, in four, 1400s, uh, said all wealth comes from God. What does that mean? All wealth comes from God. So everything and the accounts were written as a thank you to God as creator. Thank you for these assets. Thank you for these liabilities. Thank you for this equity, the balance sheet. And so Mr. Abadi believed his first principle that in a sense, all wealth comes from God. Therefore, all God wants us to do is say thank you. How, how did you see that lived out in practice though in, uh, in the bank, day to day, relationship to relationship? Very good question. Um... Now, uh, uh, John, would you like to answer this while I think this one through? Uh, it, it's um... sorry for the deep question. No, 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 please. No, it's a wonderful question. I'm just, <laughs> and there is, there is an, I, I have an answer of sorts to it. I just try to get it all together. John will be. It's the moral and material know. question, isn't it? It's the moral and material question. Correct. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's the balance between the two, and the moral. In fact, was the spiritual, or if you wish, the moral was God. And um, although we didn't refer to that very often, because I remember up with God, he would say, well, we'll finish there, Mr. Hill, we can all, we can all go home. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't ever stop the dialogue by accepting the totality of all things immersed in the Creator. We we're always searching for everything that had come out of the invisible into the material and quantify it but, uh, and look at it in terms of trade and product. Because as Ram said, whatever we were doing was actually as a trading bank. Mm. We were handling documentation. Interesting. Correct. A, relation, a relational absolutely, bank. Absolutely, absolutely, John. I'll let, let me take it a step further, but I need to digress for a minute. Mark and Anika, if you'll permit me. Uh, when I was, one of my functions uh, previous to becoming, working with Mr. Abidi, or as is, was uh, um, running a training center 
in Hong Kong. And I had the very material, and one of the courses that had to be taken part of this program, which was, you know, banking, the credits and uh, trading in uh, We've lost you, Rangam. Uh, Rangam, we've lost you. Monetary trading, foreign exchange trading. You lost me? Okay, Hello? keep going, keep going. I'm back, okay. okay. And I had these very materialistic Chinese students to whom I had to explain real management. To them, the bottom line was money. That's everything. Even the, the lady, lady who made our coffee and tea in the morning, she would watch and look at the, uh, at the board, at the share board, board every morning. So that's how materialistic mm. environment was. And in that, I came up with a model in which I said, let's look at ourselves as individuals. And I found that there were two parts, at least, the outer self, the physical self, and the inner self, which was the metaphysical self. And as I looked to these parts, I suddenly found the attributes that existed in these, again, to talk them, they would be the moral material, were diametrically opposite on each one. And that was fascinating. Mm. I.e., whatever an attribute that you pulled out on the physical side would have an attribute on the metaphysical side, which was diametrically opposite. Mm. I had over time listed over 35 or 40 of these attributes. And then as I wrote, I lost the paper, at least it, uh, it was taken away. And I never got to, got to try, only since um, uh, I've been speaking to John, I've been trying to reconstruct this. Mm. But the point I'm trying to get to is, that within us, we have the yin and the yang, or the, we are facing diametrically opposite things. You know, something that is finite on the physical side, it is infinite on the metaphysical side, okay? And if you go down and analyze the, fi the finite, the physical side, and measure anything and everything that we are, the height of whom we are, the size of whom we are, and the physical side until we eventually come down to our, to the particles, the atoms within us. And if we go through with the atoms on the one side, that's as finite as we can seem to go. But as on the metaphysical side, we don't reduce ourselves, we expand ourselves, right? From specific feelings into emotions, into what I call, what Mr. Arvid used to call an energy system. Mm. And this energy system is embodied within that finite atom. So it's a circular thing, really. And it depends where in that circular do we want to live, okay? Which, which not only do we want to live, which part of that circular position do we see ourselves in? Are we aware yeah. of the circularity of the whole process? Yeah, I think this yeah. is like what Evicina has also said. It's about pull and push. So the motive of our desires is what pulls us. And once your ego self has developed, this is the push from you. So how do you keep the balance? Are you just being pulled into the motive of your desires? Or you can also push it. So it's like exactly, you know, expansion yeah. as well. And yes, this is the metaphysical side. <laughs> Sorry, it just came to yeah, me. Yeah, no, so absolutely. Well, Langham, I must yeah. I must make a statement from my reading of, of physics. Um, I read a book a few years ago called, called Love Without End. And it, I don't want to offend anyone, but the subtitle is Jesus Speaks. And um, here's what I read. All of creation is constructed of the atom time particle. All of creation is connected by spirit and spirit is animated by love. That means it is all one expansion of love through every particle, which is all of us, all of everything. And in that sense, there's no thing to do. Absolutely. Repeat the last sentence that you said, in, in all of that, there is no- There is no thing you started with nothing. There's actually no thing to do. Uh, the flow. It's the There's flow. just being uh -huh. in that circle. 
And as a forester, I'm always reminded, we, we just were on a call with Dr. John Cobb, my mentor, um, you know, Whiteheadian theologian. And we use the forest as metaphor, as oh. circle. The alchemical uh, texts of oh. Jung and his students, Maria Louis van Franz, um, shows a snake eating its tail, right? Oh. Right. What does that mean? It means we're, we're chasing our tail, but in fact, everything's always been circle. So where are we on the circle is a profound question. It is not a demand curve. It is not a, a parabolic curve, which we see in debt, which we see in the coronavirus. It is a circle. It mm. is indeed. And that is, and that circle tends to rise. The chemical side of it, the alchemy is that it's circular because there is other aspects. Yeah, yeah. totally. But we just don't go around and keep going around in circles. We actually, it depends on the extent of, uh, how do I say it? The absorption of, of the totality within us, do we rise? Till such point in time, that at least in Hinduism, we talk about reaching the point of nirvana. Mm -hmm. or, right, right. Okay. But we rise and sometimes we don't rise. We go down as well, you know, mm -hmm. depending on, again, the state of our mind. Bearing in mind that what we, in Hinduism, we always talk about, that the totality is within us. Never look outside to find mm -hmm. that totality. Okay, And in fact, what we don't realize is when I look at you, Mark, and I look at you, Anika, and I look at you, John, people ask, where are, where are you? And I point mm -hmm. and I say, there. In fact, you're not there. You are here. Here because I see you within me, and it mm -hmm. is within my system I see you, and mm -hmm. then it is all that I am that then tends to interpret what I see, all right? So Beautiful. another person seeing the same thing will interpret it differently. Yeah. So the reality of the external world is not outside, it's here. It's inside, yeah, yeah. yeah? We just and mirror we, each other, yeah. Exactly, and once we understand that, that it's the inside that needs changing to how I perceive the outside, that I can understand the outside better and I see it in humility and in love. Without Sorry, I'm, I'm stepping in again. Please, please. So we're talking about banking. Just stop me, just, just stop me. yeah. We, are, we have what? bankers here, ex-bankers, right? And now here we are talking about this deep stuff, which is fine. I can get it. But how about if somebody asks you, how do we put all this into practice? <laughs> Is there something we can put this into practice in banking? Yes, BCCI absolutely. could be that bank. Absolutely. As but John yes. said, as John, absolutely, Anika, as John said, we were a trade bank. What is the difference between a trade bank, hmm. or trade finance, and what I'd say, statue, uh, commercial finance? The other one. I'm not saying that. I don't know what the other word, but let's retail, it, retail bank. Yeah. Okay. Let it's it's what Islamic banking is. Trade in, banks. Yeah. In 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 uh, trade banking, what we do is we take the risk of the asset that we are financing. Mm. All right. Mm. Okay. Maybe we take security, but the the benefit or the the the, the value of that whole transaction is based on the ability to take a risk on the asset. And that asset as it goes through the process of trade tends to increase in value. For example, let's take uh, or um, alumina, which is the basis for the creating of aluminum uh, ingots. All right, from coming out of Australia and going to a refinery in, China, in Serbia somewhere, uh, in Russia. I, all along, I'm willing to finance that movement, but each time the value increases. But at the end of the day, I'm taking the risk on that value of that alumina, which changes into aluminum ingots and changes positions physically and geographically. And with that, the geographical risks come about and everything. But I, what I'm saying is, when I lend the, give the money to the lender, I haven't taken security of his house, his business, his car, his wife, mm -hmm. his mother-in-law, his bunch of hats, even, whatever. I haven't done that. I'm taking the risk on the asset. And if I go wrong, it's because I haven't protected or ring-fenced my asset properly. Why that is John is, so serious? 
I, I want to. He was uh, noting about I, something. I just. Oh, John, I, what did I say? Was that the uh, wrong somewhere? I, 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 I'm amazed how you're expressing it. Uh, is I would have used other words, but you're absolutely, absolutely accurate. Uh, the only thing that is missing is the documentation, which is the asset. So, oh, that's uh, thank you, John, because the documentation is mind boggling here to come down so, to the reality of things and to answer that question you asked a long time back, Mark. How so, do we relate? So, you've just blown my mind. You've verified my writings for the last 15 years in this last 30 minutes, which is, you know, the distinction between a commercial bank, merchant bank. And, and what I would what I would call a true asset relational bank, which you're describing, and and Ike and I have you know trying to write about this, trying to articulate, trying to play it out in Excel spreadsheets. Uh, we could create money as magically as we do now against the assets. So the question from an accounting perspective is, what you're talking about is yes, there's risk associated with the asset, but there's utility. And the word utility, I I said what's a what's a util anyways? What what unit is that? I don't know. As an economist, I call it a unit of well-being. Let's say, because uh, even uh, you know John Mills and all that, they they debated that issue. Uh, so to me, it's fascinating that you're articulating a system which I've been imagining and trying to write about. Even in my own province in in Alberta, Canada, what we're saying is forget about what was true. I mean, what is possible? That, I mean, this show is about what what do we do now? And what I'm hearing is. We could do precisely what you attempted to do uh, with this bank. And, and the, the beauty of it is we all have assets and, and relationships are assets. They're just a different type of intangible asset. Mm -hmm. We know that in this moment, do I trust you? Do I trust you to put, you know, to have this conversation, you know, at this point? Yes, that is an asset. And so the relationships then are assets. The land is an asset, right? The factory mm -hmm. is an asset. They all have integrity, which means wholeness, right? So the discernment of its integrity is, is critical uh, to running a good operation, a successful bank in this case, a relational bank. And that to me is so exciting that we actually, from your experience with Mr. Abadi, you we actually do have a way forward here, which to me is just like blowing my mind. Oh, you do, you absolutely do. A, you, you just said it yourself, uh, Mark, you've been doing this for the last 15 years. So you knew it before anybody else right so you were i learned through osmosis like john does <laughs> <laughs> no you uh, it's there it's all it's it's it all can be there and as i and as john said uh, very importantly uh, the issue of documentation too is the reality of how much of from the moral of basing of taking part in the risk that's let's forget the asset or whatever it is the person who's giving money has to take part in the risk Mm. I've got and the money, you have to and have you've got the know-how. You have to have relationship and trust. Mm. Yes. Correct. Relationship Correct. without trust, Absolutely. the whole Absolutely. thing collapses. And there's risk yeah. in every relationship, right? Of course. Of yeah. course. The, so, well, the, there isn't a zero risk point, I think. I mean, it's trying to figure out what kind of scenario is where there's a zero risk scenario. It doesn't exist. All right. But uh, you minimize as absolutely right. Uh, it's, it's got to be relationship and trust. But that's when you got when you talk about getting to know your customer, or whatever the acronym for that is. It's not knowing how many you know. It's knowing the person, knowing his feeling, knowing his intent. That is the most important. Mm. So th this is really also important. I know I'm geeking out here on banking, but you know the distinction I've learned between merchant banking, you know, was. Uh, it was uh, Baustad, Edward Baustad, who went to Singapore in 1848 or whatever it was. Uh, one of the first merchant bankers to go to the East. Uh, he started Baustad & Co, Merchant Bank. Uh, what's the difference between Merchant Bank and Investment Bank? What would you say? Well, in much, Merchant Bank was the, the basis and the start of investment banks. They then evolved into investment banks. It sounded much better than calling themselves merchant bankers, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all they did was to, you know, make sure that they got their share of the profit. That's all, irrespective of how long the business lasted or not. All right. Uh, Mr. I mean, Bowstead, Mr. Bowstead understood at the end of his life that everything was about relationships and love. I believe he did, because the legacy of Bowstead continues in Singapore, Malaysia, and in London. 
the spirit of what he believed. It was, it was in a way a trade bank. Uh, in, in, and I think that's what's exciting to me is, again, we have from our history, we have these pieces we can pick up again. And uh, in the spirit of what Mr. Abadi, you know, experienced that moment of clarity. Um, mm. I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just excited. So I just want to get on with it. Let's. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, but... So shall we announce the bank today then? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it an. I mean, so what I heard, what I heard both of you saying is, we already have a model that, that was in in practice. It was an operation. It also as john you said disappeared in the uh you know in the uh, the gaza yeah. sands yeah. right and and so why did it disappear i mean we I mean, it's not just rhetorical we you, you don't have to talk about that but no. these things why do disappear did... for what reason is a question i'll give you an i'll give you my my perception as i see it let's take islamic banking islamic banking has been excuse the word corrupted why not for any other reason but because you had in Islamic banking, the system works that the person can take as much profit as he likes, as long as he's in agreement with the borrower, the person who's lending, right? He can take 100% of the profit, you know, and even more. But the essence of, of the whole thing was, is coming down to that percentage of the profit. And what people in Islamic banking started doing was in order to make it attractive, they related that amount of percentage to the market rate of interest on commercial lending. And that was wrong. The right. moment it did, did that, they equated the two together, which is not what it was. Islamic banking is a product on its own and mm -hmm. has a purity of its own, mm -hmm. not in relation to the market. But that's what's happened. That's what's happened in reality with all of us. Mm -hmm. We taste the material because this has been established and it goes back right, as I said, to the time of Newton and and Descartes and various people like that. It's mm -hmm. now that through quantum physics, through, uh, I don't know, I'm sure you've read of Fritzjof Capra. You've read his book, Turning Point. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and times like people like that who've come, found, you know, the, the totality of existence and are trying to bring it all into our day-to-day -day life. It's going to be a paradigm shift, as I said, in my little note to you, Mark, it's not a, a change of physicality, it's a change of our attitude in our mind. Mm -hmm. And you you guys have laid this. Mm. Beautiful. So Nick yeah. and I have some work to do tomorrow, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I think we are doing that work now, we are. Mark. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm yeah. so excited. I hope you, you yeah, two gentlemen are I, excited. Yeah, plus all the viewers who are joining us and watching us, and some are actually liking it. So the penny is dropping somewhere. I'm we, sure. we only have 25 listeners, but whatever. Just My God, I didn't even realize that we had listeners on. But <laughs> having said that, what I believe is just making people aware, not of banking, not of this thing, of the, of the fact that we as individuals and each one of us, every one of us seek mm. to find happiness uh, and some, whether it's through some element of materialism or whatever, but that this thing lies within us, not outside us. But mm. first to understand ourselves, very few of us have done that. I've taken the step and I've taken the first step only and it's frightening to see what's inside me, but anyway, be that as it is. <laughs> And for me, it's not just about raising that awareness. I know that within us, we all know the truth. It's the reality. It's just that we keep on forgetting. You know, it's that pull and push. You know, what pulls true. us Very is true, our Anika. Very, desires. Very true. So we keep on, we have to but keep we, on guards. Yeah, but when left to ourselves, most of us find it difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Collectively, we find it is easier to do. And mm -hmm. that's that's what you guys are doing. You're making it a collective platform for people mm -hmm. to come. And then I can relate to you much more. Like I do my, I do a yoga, I do my pranayam each morning uh, and I do it more, but I need to put the video on and listen to the guy and do yes. it with him rather yes. than doing it by myself, right? You've so said that it. togetherness and that it, it, it amounts to the independence, interdependence that we all have. What I call solidarity. This is what I've been saying, that it has to be, you know, our souls together. We are yeah. 
connected together. So it can't be an individual's, you know, doing. Now we have to now, we are connected anyways. We are, but then again, and, 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 and um, uh, quantum physics went on to prove it. Mm. When you mm, yes. they took two particles are, you know, on the other side and they fiddled with one and then it, you know, the same thing reacted on the other side. Uh, and uh, it, it's there. And it's also there within us genetically. Yeah. So what so, is the practical advice here? We all know that it is there. Um, how is, what is one practical step? For example, if we ask you, not Mark, Mark knows this. <laughs> what do we do then? The practical Speechless. step is what you've done already. Just right. get, just talk about, but we have to put it in a manner that mm. is, appeals to people that people can understand. Okay. Mm. And that's what's gone wrong. I mean, if, if what Mr. Abidi said, out of nothingness came totality, if that's the language we talk, then we will never understand it. Yeah. You know, pe most people will not understand it. It took me three months of looking at that paper every day that I was trying to figure out until it hit me. And not all of us will have that patience to do that. I did it because that was my job. I was getting paid mm. for it. Okay. So yeah. what, what, Anika, what I would suggest is mm. we have a responsibility to, um, uh, on a platform of, of principles, say the real management principles, if we just take those, right? And we can build... We can literally build in the, in the comfort of our computers and spreadsheets, right, a, a, a working model. And then we can breathe that into being. I mean, we can dream it mm. and narrate it into being. We can't, then we cannot say we didn't try, that we didn't articulate a new narrative. Definitely. Um, because we, we, we know we have a working model here that we're talking about, mm. that we could yeah. hit go tomorrow or next week. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think that's what's exciting to me. That's what I've been waiting for is there's different mm. pieces I've, I have been missing, but listening mm. to John. And, and then and, uh, Mark, we have this uh, Ahuat model as well, interest-free loans, which is coming from within the community. So the yeah. community creates that endowment or that fund or that, you know, bank or whatever. So you create, you, you have money, you have assets within the community as well, right? Yeah. And Rangam, I don't know if you know, but, you know, I've studied the central banking systems and I'm an expert in national income accounting GDP. But here's the truth. We, we don't actually run our nations with the balance sheet. There's no balance sheet. You understand there's no proper asset accounting. Therefore, the Bank of England operates without understanding how many bridges and hospitals and ventilators and happy people there are. Right. Because it's blind to these asset classes. And therefore, but here's what's possible. And we're seeing it, helicopter money, uh, you know, magically money is appearing in our bank accounts. Yes. From the, our daughter just this morning and a click of a mouse has a thousand dollars in her own bank account because she was unemployed. She's a student. But I said, mm. look how magical the money will appear yes, when we're, yes, in, we're yes. actually in a serious crisis. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then we'll have to ask, how come the government didn't create the money before? In record volumes, without even a heartbeat, and then you, well, we have to watch because how did the money get created? Oh, they mm. created as a bond to sell to the markets who are loading up on two and a half percent bond rates, right? No, 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 no. That is not what we have to do right now. We need to show people that we can create money in any supply we need. Mm. Mm. Well, um, uh, you cannot produce, create this bank in the Western system. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, 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 but that's okay. It's not a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just have to recognize that within the Western system of banking, mm. which is really based upon the dollar, irrespective of where you are, mm. um, if you don't have all of the requisite pieces in place, like, like lender of last resort, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then in one way or another, you won't even get a license to operate. So you need a license to operate, or that's within the Western banking system. But if you come out of another, say for example, you're coming out of Bhutan, who is going to regulate the bank and who is, who are we, who is going to act as our supreme body of overseers? I'm gonna disagree with you, John. Good, please. I'm going to challenge you because I don't buy any of what you just said. I don't know if I buy it either, but I thought I'd lay it out. Uh, 
as a problem. Because we're just we're just too afraid to act. Uh, I've just said that in my home province in Alberta, we have the only public bank in North America. And people look at me, I look at the premier, I've sat on the provincial audit committee. What does it mean when you have your own bank? Alberta bank. I mean, we can lend against all the assets of this province and whatever volume we want. Read the act, read the legal document, read the fine print. That's what it says. Whether we exercising the full capacity and power of that, we should be exporting it to every province right now to finance making of masks and ventilators in whatever volume we need right now. Okay. So 3D printing, whatever. It's like there is nothing stopping us from exercising the power of that legal entity called the Alberta Treasury Branch right so here. Many banks, many banks in many places dealing with the local yeah. community. Look, as local as possible and on a national level, an ecosystem of interconnected banks uh, that are publicly held. Now, here's the challenge, though, you, and I think you've touched on it. When we become each other's bankers, what happens? <laughs> Create the money collectively. We're going to decide how much we need moment to literally day by day, month by month. How will we make those decisions in a way that everyone gets enough? But it's not Marxist or communist. It's like nature works, always moving towards homeostasis, always trying to find harmony. That's the challenge as human beings, as human systems is because right now we've just become accustomed to the big banks creating money ex nihilo, like magicians. And we've taken it for granted that somehow the money just magically appears. But now when we're collectively responsible, oh, that's a whole other tall order. And I think that will challenge us as humanity. You couldn't have said it, put it better. Absolutely right. But, um, you know, um, Mark, the, the GDP for Bhutan, what the GDP for Bhutan is? I don't know. I don't care. I've advised Bhutan. I don't think Bhutan's actually a great model. Uh, no, because the GDP for Bhutan is based on happiness. It's happiness. That's, that's I would not, like to know how that works. It, it's simple. I, I'm doing this my, in my work. You just ask people how they feel. I ask in my survey, when you wake up in the morning, how much love do you feel for yourself? Whoever asks that question right now in Britain? Nobody Boris does. Johnson is, I don't know. But you know, it's like, the, these are the questions Bhutan is, so because of their Buddhist uh, philosophy, right? Which is what? R right livelihood, right relationship. Everything's righteous, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I used to teach corporate ethics, try to. Students thought it was a joke. I said, no, no, let, let, let's look at virtue. What is virtue? Oh. Virtue is the same across all faiths, basically, if you spoil it down. So in Bhutan, gross national happiness has replaced GDP, but not entirely. In China, they have Xiao Kang, which means well-being. That's their national economic strategy. I was hired to advise them on adopting that at every municipal level. So every mayor would be rewarded on well-being indicators, not just GDP. The West doesn't know anything about that. They were way ahead of China at Bhutan in some respects. So how's it progressed since? Here's a problem with Bhutan though, and I've, I I wrote this to the Prime Minister when I was in the UN with him in 2012. You're missing one thing. It's money. You could talk about happiness, but unless your monetary policy is aligned with gross national happiness and accounts of well-being measured subjectively, experientially, you got nothing. You're going to get dominated by China and India. They're going to take you. They're going to take your assets because they control that system. If Bhutan doesn't have its sovereign monetary system like China has, then it's not going to work. So we're going round and round in circle. Then. No, no. No? No, no, no we're no. not. We're no, not. No. And I, I advised the Bhutanese prime minister at the time. I said, I can help you design a monetary policy system. In fact, I think we're sitting in the wrong place. I think we should be in George Soros's office. No, we should just be on Wall Street because that's where the real power is, not in the UN chambers here. Mm. Oh, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Just sorry, just to digress for a minute, Mark. You said you'd done this with, uh, with the Chinese municipalities. You know, how, no, with, how the, you... with the national government. So, in, of course, the in China. Government. When the when oh. the Communist Party says you will adopt Xiao Kang well-being indicators to and we will reward you, we will re remunerate every mayor based on your performance. They were scared. They were like, "Holy shit!" Like in the West, 
We have industrial cities that are going to get penalized against vis-a-vis -vis Shanghai, which is cleaner, right? They were, they didn't like it, but that's what the, the party could adopt and impose on every mayor. So that well-being now becomes uh, the central feature of performance and measurement. And that's what I'm trying to do in my work everywhere. And that's what Bhutan is trying to do. You're recognizing an invisible and intangible asset as the basis of the value of any currency that's issued. Is that right. right. And Rangam, you've said it. It comes from ex asking our, our heart centers, how do we feel, right? Interesting as economists, we, we love objective measures. Like we think statistics are like the be all end all, like everything can be reduced as Descartes said to, I think therefore I am. And we forgot about respecting feeling and emotion. Because we're emotional beings, we, we are feeling beings. And if we don't ask those questions, people say, I've never been asked these questions. I say, isn't that interesting? We measure all kinds of things, life expectancy and disease rates and everything else and GDP, but we never ask people how they feel about their neighbors. You know, it's like, and so we have to start. We have it, we need, we need a new accounting system. And that, that's what I've been trying to, I know I'm, I'm this is no, no, not please, my please, platform. Please carry on, carry on, don't stop. Because that's so, done. So this is the model that, you know, and Anik and I have spent the last several months as friends trying to work this operating system out and it can be at different levels, central bank to local bank to corporation X, Y, Z, to but the government of England. Right? To, to interrupt, Mark, um, does this take into account what Mr. Avidi always talked about was that the material balance sheet has only value if there is a corresponding moral balance sheet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what's missing. So the, the integrity of relationship, right? The level of, you know, they say in string theory or whatever, physics, right? If you think about two nodes in a network binomial, right? You, you and I are like this close together now, that, that string that, that attaches us, right? That level of trust is, is thin, precious, and, and short now, but it's not, that's a fascinating model if you look at and my friend, he's a military strategist, he mapped out the emergence of tuber tuberculosis. And he said, if you watch the pattern of tuberculosis, tuber tuberculosis outbreaks, it matches the dating patterns in high schools. Wow. <laughs> but, and I said, wait a minute, what you're saying is every string, every line between two nodes can be measured in a sense of, right? The integrity of that trust can actually be measured. I can ask you, how much do I trust you out of 10 points? I'm like, wow, this is fabulous. This is taking measurement to a new level. Now we become circular, circular, not but binomial. Can, but you, you beg this question. Are we, are we taking the intangible and converting it into the tangible? And therefore the value of the intangible that it had has lost most of it when it became tangible. Well, remember the whole basis, this, is, this will blow your mind, I'm sure, because it blew my mind when I, because I was trained in accounting. Debits equals credit. Lucas says, all wealth comes from God. How can, how can you have a, an equal balancing bookkeeping entry if you're comparing different units of measure? Ah, here's a oh. trick. The only way to compare in, in the ledgers, debits equals credit, is if you monetize the transaction. Correct. Now, now we're, we're spinning out of control. I just told you money's created a thin air, not related to any assets. So you're using money as a means of balancing the entries in the, in the ledgers and you've monetized all the assets and the liabilities and even the equity. And you've lost sight of the physicality, the very nature, because the first thing an accountant does is take inventory. Mr. Abadi would understand. Right. Absolutely. Yes. You measure the number of Hondas in the pot in the, you know, or in the, in the parking lot, in, right, so it's a physical inventory, which begs the question, how do we measure the physical nature of land assets, right? If not through measuring their integrity and their potential yeah. value, their p value in the land valor mean to be strong or worthy. Okay, 
that I, I, I buy that, but then what we're looking at is basically an asset, as you very rightly said earlier, okay? And we're trying to find a value to that asset system. Am I correct? Remember, value of alorum meaning to be strong or worthy. Not want, okay. Again, we get trapped, right? The trap here is we want to, we divert to monetization of everything. The snake around the stick on the demand supply curve. I, look, I looked at that graph forever as a econ student. Like, what is that snake around the stick on the y-axis? Who, who said that is value? Hmm. I'm not going to sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. No, I know I, I didn't mean to go off on a... No, 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 no. For God's sake, this is, this is what I've been... Because one of the things I'm trying to do and I've, I'm lost is if what I mentioned earlier, that we've got the two parts within us, the physical and the metaphysical, and we've got attributes which are diametrically opposite. Therefore, if we have a physical balance sheet and what we are talking about now, the metaphysical balance sheet or the moral balance sheet, if we go to balance the physical balance sheet, then the diametrically opposite side of the moral balance sheet would be an unbalanced moral balance sheet. What is an unbalanced moral balance sheet? That's what I've got to find out. I'm saying, who cares? 500 years of accounting. Who did Luca learn from? The Sumerians, probably. I don't know. The Babylonians. That's right? some metaphysical other cultures. And, and so you just sterilize yeah. it with, with Leonardo da Vinci. Like, they just wrote it down. They codified right, the protocols. But for 500 years, we've been using this accounting system, which in a way doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. Because it's, it's, missing, it's missing the emotions, the, the intangibility and feelings. It's missing that. That's why. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. it's, it's, it's corrupt, it's raw, it's brutal by itself. It's becoming hard as stone, okay? Absolutely. And that's what we've got to come out of. But it and was useful. It... Remember who he was writing for? Who was Luca advising? He was a Franciscan monk. He was advising the Pope and the Medicis. Right. How did the Medicis become the dominant bankers of, of Europe, of Italy? Because of the double entry bookkeeping system. But each one of them turned from what the initial monk said, from which was driven out of the intangible and the metaphysical world to, to justifying what we're doing materially. The Medici's forgot all that and became solid material bankers. Yeah. And what they have done today. And what I'm saying is that today's world, we are devoid of any form of emotions. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to stop talking because Anika, I think you can bring this back by saying we have forgotten, haven't we? <laughs> I've said it many times. <laughs> <where I'm> say, <laughs> no, I'm just thinking that we have discussed this many times as well. It's not just, you know, so is this the right time is the question we are asking. It is. It's Collectively. More so now than ever. Yes. I have to say, this is an amazing conversation. I know I've been talking a lot, but... Yes. No, I no, no, it's fine. Because these are conversations one... that need mm. to happen. And, and they're calm. They're centered. Mm. You know, we're not caught in the emotion of coronavirus. I mean, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's a wake-up call. This is an important window, a, a breath, a pause. And I think what an amazing conversation mm. with yeah. all of us, really. Because you, you've seen all those memes appearing. And as uh, Richard Dawkins, he, he said that about, you know, the meme, the memes appearing now are saying, oh, but we, you know, power corrupts and, you know, you, money can't save us at the moment. So people are sort of thinking along those lines. I just sit there and I read all those things. And, you know, it's first time in history, I think people are saying those things that, Paris is not romantic anymore. Disneyland has no magic anymore. You know those things. So maybe people are now exploring and going inwardly. Um, yes, so we have discussed all this. So what is the practical step here? This is what we are asking all of you. So keep thinking and we will continue these talks again. Thank you for watching us.